So this is the brain. And again, this is this is not my opinion. I want to <laughs> make sure you understand. Um, this is um, medical and scientific evidence. This is not something off some website. Um, I, I disclose to you what I do. I'm the editor chief for three medical journals, alternative therapies, advances in mind-body medicine, microbiology research. I'm the co-editor of Microbes, medical advisor for my micro lab. I'm the reviewer of various, uh, of, of a couple of medical journals. I am on the editorial board of others. So um, let's look at the brain. It's the only organ completely protected by the body. The heart is not. If you look at the heart, I mean, you know, it's you can reach it in between your ribs, but not the brain. It's completely surrounded by bone, the skull. It weighs three pounds, about two pounds of two percent of our body weight, but it uses twenty to thirty percent of the calories we consume. And from the carotid and vertebral arteries, carotid in the front, vertebral in the back, the brain receives the most oxygenated blood emerging from the heart than any other organ. <clears throat> and it uses 20% of the oxygen absorbed by the lungs. Have you ever thought how many gallons of blood flow through the brain every hour? Well, just to let you know, it's 13 gallons every hour. Or about 20% of all the blood pumped by the heart. And we have over 400 miles of blood vessels. They're mostly capillaries, but these have to reach all of the 100 billion neurons, nerve, nerve cells in the brain. Every one of those nerve cells needs oxygen needs nutrients, et cetera. And every person's thoughts, memories, emotions, actions, reactions, all of these are stored in the brain. Isn't that a marvelous, fantastic organ? So two important points. A mold that produces mycotoxins doesn't produce one mycotoxin one mold gives us, but it produces one mold makes several different kinds of mycotoxins, okay? So if a mold that produces mycotoxins is in a, in a home or a building, then those mycotoxins it produces are also there. And size matters. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, here, it's about 100 microns thick. Spores are 2 to 4, 3 to 4 microns. Mycotox is 0 0.1. What is that size? It's the same size as the size of a virus. And maybe you've heard about this virus that's been affected us all over the last three years, uh, the COVID. Well, it's about the same size as that. Have you ever had a COVID test by urine? Of course not. That's why you shouldn't test for mycotoxins in urine. How do you get exposed to mycotoxins? Mainly by inhalation and, and through the skin. From food, it's minimal. It's not even, it's negligible. Now, this is from a study that is in red. Mycotoxins trigger the onset of exacerbate or exacerbation of chronic inflammatory diseases and autoimmune disorders. Now, I'm going to show you why that's important. Where do mycotoxins first affect the body? In the brain. <clears throat> that's the overwhelming medical and scientific evidence the first place it goes affects is the brain and nervous system you have the brain on the left there and it destroys brain cells by dysregulating mitochondria and causing 
cell apoptosis. What that means is cell death. And also mycotoxins destroy the blood brain barrier. So if you're going to all these so-called summits and whatnot and uh, internet uh, websites and whatnot that say how to fix mitochondrial dysregulation, you're missing the point. It's mycotoxins that do it. You got to get rid of the mycotoxins. You can't fix my, the mitochondria unless you get rid of the mycotoxins. Okay, so one big sentence. Many indoor air mycotoxins are neurotoxic. And here's the evidence down at the bottom of where you can get this, et cetera. So you get them from indoor air. What are the neurological effects of these mycotoxins? Autism spectrum disorder, pandas, pans, cans, pitan, neuromyelitis optica, and I've treated so many patients with this particular disorder, the neuromyelitis optica, as well as chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, so much so that um, 20 years ago, I wrote a textbook on it. Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, movement disorders, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. All these are from, start with mycotoxins. So let's talk about children first. PANDAS, what that stands for is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection, CANS. Childhood Acute Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, PITAN, Pediatric Infection Triggered Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric. Do you see the words all basically are the, describing uh, something going on in the brain and something that is autoimmune? And you've watched, hopefully, my webinars on mycotoxins and autoimmune disorders and how I show you the before and after pictures of actual patients and before and after of, text of their test results. So here is the microbiota, in other words, microbiome and microglia. Microglia is a cell, an important immune cell of the brain. So you can follow this and you can see that in the embryonic stage, oops, sorry, let's go back. In the embryonic stage, embryonic central, CNS, central nervous system, that is affected by maternal infection, inflammation, chronic inflammation from the mother, chronic stress from the mother, and the exposure to pollutants from the mother, which cause altogether a maternal dysbiosis of the microbiota, the microbiome. And then you have the neonatal microglia. This is the, those immune cells in the brain and so then you go on to the postnatal postnatal stages, healthy brain, but if the brain's been affected by these things, such as mycotoxins, you have neurodevelopmental disorders. Let me take this a step further. On the left, you have normal development. I want you to remember this microglia. This is a cell in the brain. It's an immune cell, okay? And then on the right, you have the autism. What happens? You have these pro-inflammatory mediators. You have debris, you have inflammation, and you have blood-brain barrier permeability. And it starts at the bottom with altered microbiota and leaky gut. You see the epithelium? and the leaky gut. Okay, so having said that, let's go to the next step. 
children and ochratoxin, which is a mycotoxin. Okay. Um, embryonic development of nervous tissue tissues is very susceptible to the toxic effects of ochratoxin. And ochratoxin induces teratogenic effects in neonates exposed inside the uterus, in utero. This is from, again, studies. The other part is that children with and mycotoxins, they're very susceptible, okay? Um, they are susceptible to ochratoxin. Their immune system and the kids' immune systems are not mature yet. Their gut microbiome is not neither mature nor stable. And the cytochrome P450 that helps detoxify is not effective yet. And then kids go to the doctor, the pediatrician, they give them antibiotic, et cetera. And this further causes an imbalance. Un, I, I, it's not an imbalance, it's an unbalance of the microbiome leading to dysbiosis, leaky gut, GI disorders, and inflammations, okay? Um, so at the neurodevelopmental level, particularly cognitive, cognitive and sensitive processes can be affected. By the way, chronic fatigue syndrome is caused by mycotoxins. And if you haven't gotten that yet, there's a lot of evidence towards that. Now let's look at T2 toxin, another mycotoxin. It's one of the most toxic mycotoxins. It can easily penetrate and damage the blood-brain barrier and accumulate in brain tissue um, and cause neurotoxicity. And the molecular mechanism in, in, uh, from T2 toxins include oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction in the central nervous system, the brain. And the brain is highly susceptible to these two. So you have to understand, you don't treat mitochondrial dysfunction, you treat the mycotoxins and that gets rid of the mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm coming back now to this cell called the microglia that we talked about. And in all these children's disorders. Okay, why? Because they play a fundamental role in orchestrating the brain development in these children. And the alterations in the function of any of these cells, microglial cells, could be the driving force in the several neurodevelopmental disorders. And as I mentioned before, that microglia is the main resident immune cell of the central nervous system, and they are the main producers of pro-inflammatory mediators in neuroinflammation. So some of the main symptoms of these disorders of ASD, PANDAS, PANS, et cetera, such as impairment of multisensory processing and integration, been linked, these are linked to neuroinflammation, which is what I started off with at the beginning, neuroinflammation. So here's a study. Uh, this is out of Tufts University School of Body Medicine in Boston University. Effects of mycotoxins on neuropsychiatric symptoms and immune processes. So they did 87 urinary mycotoxins, 87 kids, but no one worked. However, when they did the serum immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin E levels, those were a more reliable index of long-term exposure. And these are the ones from my micro lab. These are tested. These are the ones tested by my micro lab. So having said that, let's go to this study by mold mycotoxins and a dysregulated immune system, a combination of concern. Here we go again. Mycotoxins trigger the onset of exacerbation of chronic 
inflammatory diseases and autoimmune disorders. We're coming back to this, okay? So let me take it a little further. Inflammation, autoimmunity, and mycotoxins. Neuroinflammation will clinically manifest as, for example, epilepsy, seizures, thermoregulation problems, and conditions sometimes observed in mold and mycotoxins affected patients. And both POTS and MECSF okay, were found common in children and youngsters exposed to indoor molds at schools and or at homes occurring in 60% of the time and 69 of respondents respectively. So this is the medical evidence. This is not opinion. This is not something that somebody wrote on some website. Here is a study that you can link and it was published two years ago in 2020. And I don't go by what people's opinions are, okay? Doesn't matter what people say at conferences. What matters is what is written, what is evidence. Okay, central nervous system, the brain, analyses revealed that gliotoxin, this is a mycotoxin, locally increased the inflammatory genes and cytokine productions exacerbating neuroinflammation. Okay, so again, this is what we, we get back. Um, and by the way, the comment about Dr. Theo Haridis, wonderful comment, and thank you for that, um, for that in, in the chat. I appreciate that very much. MS, gliotoxin. MS is one of the most frequent and severe demyelinating neurological diseases, and it's an autoimmune disease, mainly affecting younger people eventually leading to them becoming disabled. And you've seen pictures of me with my patients who came to me in wheelchairs and now are fine and they're playing volleyball. They were diagnosed with MS because gliotoxin and mycotoxin causes MS. So this is a study from Rutgers University Medical School. We propose here that fungal toxins are the underlying cause of multiple sclerosis. Okay, so having said that, you treat the mycotoxins, and guess what happens? Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, here we go. And here's an, uh, this study. Multiple sclerosis pathophysiology is from gliotoxin has been showing damage to microglia. Remember this cell. This is the immune cell of the, of the brain. Astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And for those of you who may remember this, oligodendrocytes are the cells in the brain that produce myelin. They damage this gliotoxin. Now, I'm going to show you something pretty surprising. Glutathione promotes gliotoxin-induced cytotoxicity. So all of you who are in love with glutathione, who go to all these websites where they say wonders about glutathione, if you have gliotoxin, you should not take glutathione. You have all the others, that's fine. But if any of them, include gliotoxin, it's going to make you worse. I'm going to show some more. So, gliotoxin aggravates experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis by triggering neuroinflammation, inflammation of the brain. MS resolution by antifungal therapy so what does that mean? If you have MS and you give them an antifungal, they get better. 
And this is compromises a strong evidence that supports fungi as a major contribution to this disease. Okay. So here we go into T2 toxin. It's able, it can cross the blood brain barrier and accumulate in the brain. Okay. And again, in this study published a couple of years ago, Gliotoxin toxicity increased in the presence of glutathione. So please, no glutathione. Then here's another one. Neurotoxicity of tricotsin T2 toxins and deoxynevolenol, which is abbreviated into um, DON. So deoxynevolenol disrupts, it's also known as vomitoxin, by the way. DON disrupts the central nervous network, including neuroendocrine and growth hormone signaling. Neuroendocrine, meaning all your hormones. Now, notably, the con contamination of molds and mycotoxins has been identified in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. Moreover, deoxynevolenol can significantly affect the normal activities of the nervous system and the endocrine system, and then cause damage to brain cells. <clears throat> what does that mean? It means that it changes your hormones. In women, it imbalances thyroid hormone. This is the principal cause for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, problems with um, progesterone, and estrogen that are hard to deal with. And also in men, it reduces dramatically the amount of testosterone you are making. So instead of taking more testosterone, fix the problem and the testosterone come back, comes back to normal levels again. And at the last, T2 toxin changes the cellular structure and function in the brain. So this is why all these diseases start with mycotoxins. So this is from Dr. Daniel Amen, who is the leading authority in everything that has to do with um, spec scans of the brain, single photon emission computerized tomography of the brain. And it's a, it's a three-dimensional picture. I'm only showing the two-dimensional here. Um, so here's a healthy brain on the left and look at the toxic brain on the right, you see how different it looks on a spec scan? So save your money, don't order MRIs, CAT scans of the brain and all that, it doesn't help. So here's a study, it was from 2015. Different brain regions are infected with fungi in Alzheimer's disease, this is eight years old. And look at what it says, the frontal cortex, the part that's in the front of the brain, cerebral hemisphere, all the different parts show they were infected by fungi molds. And they were also observed in blood vessels. Now, I'm sure you're surprised by that, but wait till you see this one. Here's fungal infection in cerebral spinal fluid and brain tissue from patients with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Compelling evidence of fungal infection in the ALS patients analyzed, okay? And this study was published also in 2015, so it's not new. And here's a newer study, okay? Um, and this is from 2018. And these are uh, doctors here from North Carolina, Neurotoxicity Research Journal. This effect on glutamate expression is important evidence for the role of mycotoxins and ALS antibodies and neurotoxins in blood, cerebral spinal fluid, and brain tissues and samples from a large cohort or group of ALS patients. So there you go, you treat this. Um, okay, so sorry. 
Here's another one to go. Mycotoxins in patients with Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease. Okay, this is biomonitoring of mycotoxins in plasma. Okay, again, this is antibody testing, not PP testing. This is the actual blood test, which is, and blood does not lie. This plasma levels of 10 mycotox, 10 different mycotoxins from patients diagnosed with neurodegenerative disease, 44 with Parkinson's disease and 24 with Alzheimer's disease were analyzed. And you know what they found? They found ochratoxin, A and B, stereomatocystin, nivolenol, deoxynivolenol antibodies. All these are tested for by my micro lab. Parkinson's disease and microglia. We go back to this special cell microglia cell. One of the most salient features of Parkinson's disease pathology is neuroinflammation. The same as for pandas and autism and cans, etc. This is mainly from microglia and astrocyte activation. <clears throat> and these are due to fungi and mycotoxins in the brain. So again, I'm bringing you back that from childhood, whether it's autism or Alzheimer, whether it's pandas or Parkinson's, these all are triggered by mycotoxins. Now, let's talk about treatment a minute because people get freaked out when I say to them, you've got to take itraconazole, and they go online and look up Dr. Google, who tells them, oh, you're going to die, your liver is going to fry, all kinds of nasty things. So here's from a journal, from medical evidence. Itraconazole, also known as Spornox, is a common antifungal agent that was developed in the 1980s. It has been in clinical use for 35 years with an established safety record. So having said all this, what do you do when you have, as a, as a pediatrician or as a doctor seeing children or as a doctor seeing patients with MS or with Alzheimer and Parkinson's and ALS, use this patient questionnaire. It helps guide the clinician. The first two pages are symptoms. And these are symptoms commonly found in patients suffering from molds and mycotoxins. Okay, and you score the test. The whole questionnaire is 14, 15 pages long. Okay, and you, you, the patient fills out this. They say, how, when did it first start? How bad is it today? One to 10, it's easy for them to do. So here's the page one of that. And notice that fatigue is number one because that is the number one symptom of mycotoxins and molds, fatigue, okay? And I wanna give this important point. Once you start treatment on your patient, retest after six months of treatment, not six months from the first test, but six months since you started the treatment, not before. And this is a very basic principle that's so important. So base your diagnostics, how you, how you do the testing and everything, not on the opinion of, of others and, and what others uh, uh, you know, my stories, they say that so-and-so did this and this and so on and so forth. No, base it on, and not on the internet, blogs, unvalidated tests, unproven treatments, like all the, the, the big talk of uh, binders, which have no place in medical science. Use medical and scientific evidence. I've given you here studies. I've given you, I, I, I take the juice and squeeze it out 
and summarize it for you. So you making it easier for you to, to grasp. What is the most precise and accurate test for mycotoxins? It's the test done by my micro lab. It's 12 different mycotoxins. It gives you the IgG antibodies, which is a toxic reaction, and the IgE antibodies, which is a mast cell activation for everybody, for, for your patients. And if you have any questions, send me an email at immunedoctor at gmail.com. And remember, every other Wednesday starting, and, and this is next Wednesday, I've done this for months and months and months, it's tea time. And at this tea time, you can ask me about anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be about mold and mycotoxins. You can ask me about Lyme, co-infections, heavy metals, uh, chemicals, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I invite you to, uh, uh, you know, uh, ask any, any kind of questions. And I want to share with you these three studies. If you want them, please let me know. Um, and I agree with the, um, uh, with the comment that opportunists and charlatans are in for a feeding frenzy on people desperate for help for mold because I get, and I've stated this before, uh, 10 to 15 emails every day, seven days a week from people who've tried all these expensive doctors with expensive tests and expensive treatments and are still sick after several years. So, um, I'm sorry, molds, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions or mycotoxins and their effect in children, the brain and mycotoxins. These are all published studies. These are not opinions. They all have a series of references at the end so you can look up everything you would like to learn. Um, um, so I hope that you um, enjoyed this lecture. Again, uh, you can ask for this um, and just by shooting me an email at immunedoctor at gmail.com. Hope to see you next Wednesday, three o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast, noon on the Pacific Coast. And you can ask about anything. And I hope you all learn something that, yes, there is hope. Yes, there is help. Don't give up. You can be treated and get well again. And I say this based on over 100 studies that I've published, chapters in medical textbooks, and just as important, almost 16,000 patients that I've treated over the last 30 some odd years and who are well. Well, folks, any, um, Oh, here's a question. If a patient is positive for both mycotoxin and metals, would you prioritize the treatment of fungi or, or chelate at the same time? No, you get rid of the fungi. One of the things is where do people get heavy metals from? And the studies point basically at two things. Well, of course, if you live in certain parts of the country, uh, like certain towns where they have got lead in the in the drinking water. You heard about what happened in Michigan and all that. But the, the other part is that people eat fish, raw fish, ahi, tuna, and so forth and so on. And for example, you've got to be very careful with fish because what contains high levels of mercury and other heavy metals, bluefish, sea bass, crab, grouper, mackerel, marlin, orange roughy, uh, salmon if it's farmed, tuna, swordfish, paddlefish. So they contain a lot of metals. And people eat, and I see it on the menu in restaurants all over. That's a place. The other, so you start with, with, getting rid of the mycotoxins. And what is the relationship of Lyme disease and mold? And I've, I did a recent 
uh, webinar on molds and lime, uh, or specifically on just lime. Essentially, <clears throat> when you when you you have antibodies to mycotoxins, it lights up the Lyme test. It's called cross reactivity. You don't have Lyme, but the test is positive. And so are the co-infections. So is EBV, EMV, CMV, HHS V6, V6, and a bunch of other tests. They light up because of cross reactivity, although you don't have those diseases. And I actually wrote an article and published it a few years ago on how to differentiate between the two. And if you just send me an email, I'll send you the article. And uh, if someone has parasites and mycotoxins, you always type, you always treat toxins first because they'll kill you. And they cause cancer. They cause teratogenic effects in babies inside mothers, et cetera. How does Spornox remove mycotoxins? Mycotoxins are secondary metabolites of mold spores. You kill the mold spore, there's no more mycotoxin. Are we to treat the mold only or do we also detox the mycotoxins? They're two together. Molds, the secondary metabolites of molds are mycotoxins. They're, they're like a key on a keychain. They're together. Do you recommend treating with the Spornox with any mycotoxin amount detected? Yes. Uh, let me ask you this question. How much mercury is it okay for you to have as a toxin? None. So how, do you want some mycotoxin? No, you don't want some mycotoxin. You don't want some mercury. You don't want some glyphosate. You don't want some arsenic. You don't want any. So yes, you treat it. No matter how much you have, if you have a lot or a little, you, you don't want any. These are toxins. Um, the word we used to use before World War II was poison. You don't want any poison in you. So, to clarify. Uh, are you colonized with mold or are you exposed to mold? You can have one, the other, or both. So it depends on your test results. So to clarify, if Spornox is to work for mycotoxin illness, we're assuming everyone is colonized with mold. Not necessarily. You could be currently exposed, but not necessarily colonized yet. And there's a great study by Dr. Ponikow, chairman of the Department of Ear, Nose, and Throat Surgery at the Mayo Clinic, who published a study on this um, years ago. Uh, 210 patients with chronic sinusitis, and they had colonization by mold, and therefore mycotoxins. But some people are living in a mold environment or working, or it's in their car or it's at the gym. So they get randomly exposed because if they have it at home, they go to work, or if they have it at work. One easy test, one easy question to ask people is when you go off on vacation, how do you feel? If they start feeling better, that means it's in their home. And, I mean, I'm just giving you an example. Any any other questions? So we'll have to shut this down. I uh, invite you for the next one, uh, which will be next week at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Look forward to all of you talking, joining me. And again, if you have anything, just email me. I answer quickly. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>